Oh hey, didn't see you there. I've been thinking I've been too productive in life. I wish there was some way I could be the opposite of that. Ah, anime. The lifeblood of every degenerate and every Midwestern parent's greatest fear. I don't understand any of this! Anime is one of the current visual mediums that has gained a ton of attention ever since its conception and its influence in the West, making it one of the art industry's surging powerhouses. That's due in part with how it's marketed and how it's perceived in the general public. Like, what is anime? Well, it originated from Japan. And that's all you need to know. To see, Japan's track record with being strange is a speedrun. And I love it. What else could you find? A cynical zombie being forced to turn into a chainsaw-wielding, pink-filled, magical girl with an armor wearing necromancer and a voluptuous ninja. I would keep an eye on Croatia if I were you. It's this absurdity that makes people double-take on anime as a whole. Even the more basic concepts of people punching each other can be made into a great spectacle when put in the hands of great storytellers and a land of rich lore. I mean, really think about it. Where does the process of making anime even begin? Because I have some questions for whoever made this. Now it could be argued that anime began the moment animation itself began. After all, the word anime means animation in Japan. But that's another can of worms for another day. But the exact origins of anime seems to vary from source to source. The general consensus is that the first anime commercially distributed was a short film named Kobo Shingacho Mei no Shippai, released in 1917. Made by Oten Shimakawa, it was filmed with each frame drawn on the chalkboard, but unfortunately, there seems to be no existing surviving film. But, that same year, another short film was released and was found nearly 90 years later at an antique store. You can find worse things at an antique store. Namakura Katana by Janichi Kochi follows a foolish samurai by an adult sword and trying to ambush people. And I gotta say, it's a neat little film. You can see early animation tools being used, like this wanderer walk across the Ronin as the Ronin reflectively moves the legs. There's also this unique environment that went into creating a visual personality with no audio. And this new medium will make waves in the new Japanese animation industry, with Kochi, Shimokawa, and Seijiro Kitayama being called the fathers of anime. So, next time you see this. <laughs> Or Make sure you have the salt ready. Thanks, Dad. With their contributions, it was a slow climb for the animation industry in Japan to gain traction. Though many early films aren't lost, their importance isn't. One of the surviving reels is Momotaro Sacred Soldiers, which happens to be the very first anime feature film. It's a propaganda film made near the end of World War II, and it features characters from the Japanese folktale Momotaro. Don't they all? While it's a good film of the times, it's interesting to note its overall importance in animation history. Not only does it take creative liberties with Japanese culture, something many anime would follow, but it also inspired Osamu Tezuka. Who? Lion King. Ah. In my opinion, this is where anime shines. Artists and writers embracing their roots to come out with unusual but warm thoughts that show a creative pull towards the ideas in their heritage. It also helps that they serve as their own collective pool for others to get excited and inspired. Anime's got this reputation of being strange, but as of recent years, it's become one of the most versatile styles in animation in the world and is becoming more mainstream by the day. It's honestly really cool to see the evolution of anime throughout the years with its trends, animation styles, studios, and the overall value in the industry as one of Japan's and the world's biggest pop cultural phenomenons. But from an outsider's perspective, it can be dauntingly obtuse to see the typical anime. For many of us, our first anime were among those big names like One Piece, Dragon Ball, Pokemon, but you soon come to realize that that rabbit hole is much deeper and more strange than you'd think. I began fully committing myself to watching anime in 2013, starting with Naruto, Cowboy Bebop, Full Metal Panic, and Is This a Zombie? That rabbit hole is looking a lot like an oil excavation by this point. 
Yep, among having some of the most notable shows, breaking my non-degeneracy virginity, I also fell into this. No mouth soap will clean that way. I tried. The show itself is how I described it earlier, a zombie boy forced into a magical girl position who lives with a necromancer, a ninja, and the girl who forced him to take her place. I jinx and came to the And even though it's not good by any means, Is This a Zombie still holds a special place in my heart for bringing that unique anime experience that led me down the road of highs and... And yeah, I should do this time. I find that as you do step into that world of anime, it slowly becomes easier to digest. I think this is because of how so many shows manage to build their worlds in believable if not bizarre context. Among other things, how Japanese culture itself becomes more rooted into pop culture. A good example of this is Mushishi, a story about a traveling Mushi expert who goes around helping people with what bugs them. What's a Mushi? They're sort of parasitic insect spirits that will harm people if not dealt with correctly. But the impressive part about the show is how down to earth and true it can stay to its narratives, with the Mushi having little actual significance to the growth of the characters. For as strange of a concept the show peddles itself to be, it is surprisingly good therapy replacement. Which is good because my insurance doesn't cover perpetual blindness. Hi, I just watched Pupa. You're on your own. It's weird to hear people rave about how good or bad anime is nowadays when I would argue that's always been in the stasis of okay. It's just the timing of when you first start off is where the medium becomes the first litmus test. For you, it's either basic or acidic. This is one of 2007's more tamer shows. I won't deny that as time passes, your taste and personal preference will change along with your enjoyment of anime. But I think that as the industry evolves, it should be remembered that it is still an industry. The trends in the seemingly recycled plastic that are seen throughout the years are intrinsic in the business model so large and varied. It makes sense that by following the demographics of what audiences would want, there are bound to be more cross-familiar conceptions than that of a Hasbrook household, some more than others. Take your pick. I prefer my cross-breeding with a side of trash myself. The sheer variety of anime so much that it comes full circle to returning to something familiar is oddly poetic in a sense. As the ideas get reused, they become more normalized, getting audiences more and more prepared for something familiar with a dash of a different spice, even if that spice is hot garbage. But what if they want so much of the same plot that they don't even change the title, in case you need more vampire homes in your life? I know you're out there. Anime franchises. These are properties that have a substantial enough of a fan base, and the producers are smart enough to try to capitalize on it. Nowadays, it's easy to get called a franchise. If a show or medium has a good deal of merchandise, numerous projects in the works, or is just plain popular enough to nearly stand on its own, then the risk of finding the audience diminishes. But a franchise doesn't always mean success, nor is it always guaranteed. The market is just as competitive to stay in as it is to break into. Which is why I'm campaigning for justice for real wars. I need more pointless train hentai in my life. Franchises, whether they're good or not, are just as integral to the evolution of anime as any other form. Not only can they help shape a new idea or style for years to come, they also help thrive the industry as a whole on merch sales, production goals, and even consumer demands to see what the next Naruto is up to. Okay, bad example. But even then, there's no denying that it is a system of reloading into a market with both innovative and redone ideas that has helped curve us into this hellhole of a hobby. Anime is just this enigma of a hobby. There's so many entry points you can get into with the varying difficulties of entryway. Some started with Naruto and Sailor Moon, while others started on undead sex crimes and military Mickey Mouses. And there's no problem if you don't get into anime or if there's someone you know who can't get a complete grasp on it either. It's an art that thrives on using odd storylines, interesting character designs, abnormal imagery, and a suspension of disbelief defined against practical physics. It's a completely stylistic preference. But I can't deny that for me, some of the greatest works of art I've ever seen have been anime. Shows that not only influenced my way of thinking in the real world, but expanded my own cultural understanding of humanity and philosophy. Sure, I would like more people to watch some degree of anime, because the shows worth watching aren't as rare as you think. 
And as the media is becoming more of the norm, the stigma of the deadly otaku seems to be thinning as the world just accepts the evolution and the creativity that comes with anime and its growing popularity. Which means we can properly be called dirty weebs. As nature intended. <laughs>